Hi, welcome to Sidewalk Talk. I'm Steve Fortunato. And this podcast is all about stories, stories of inspiration, information, and, and education. And I, I think today's podcast, this episode is special for me. Uh, it, it is really a story of, of, well, there's education involved too, but to me, it's an inspirational story. We are, uh, we're so glad to be joined by Dennis Williams. If you are if you're listening or watching in the Buffalo area, you may remember Dennis for many years as a sportscaster on WIVB TV channel four. He has moved on to many other things since, and we're going to go talk about all those. First, Dennis, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Such a treat to be on with you and uh, catching up with you. And uh, I know we've been talking a lot recently, so it's, it's, it's my pleasure. It's great to be here. So you're, you're in, um, you, you're in Cape, you live out in Sacramento, but right now you're, you're with family in Cape Cod? Yeah, I kind of, uh, I'm an empty nester now, so I kind of split time on both coasts. And my job now, we'll get into that later, allows me to pretty much work remotely anywhere. So um, I'd say it's kind of 50-50. I'm, I'm on the West Coast because of clients I have out there about 50 to 60% of the time. And then the rest of the year I'm traveling, and, and much of that travel includes being near family on the East Coast, which is rough Cape Cod, Boston area. Yeah. All right, so Dennis, take us back. You, you, you're from where you are now. You're out from yeah. the Boston area, right? And yeah. you go to school at Hamilton in yeah. New York. Uh, how did you end up getting into, obviously you must like sports, uh, but yeah. how did you get into the sports casting side of things? Well, I was doing just as a side gig in college because Hamilton's a liberal arts school and I was a history major and a theater minor of all things. And I was just on the side running the radio station with another friend of mine and he and I kind of controlled the radio station. I was program director and I got to be the play-by-play guy for the hockey team and the football team almost all four years I was there. So I got a lot of broadcast kind of experience. And then I parlayed that into an internship at the NBC affiliate in Utica, New York, which is a tiny, market, tiny market. market. And I 2,542. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they had a weather girl during sports and she couldn't pronounce any of the names of the players. Yeah. So I would literally go in and produce her sports cast and phonetically write out the names so she could pronounce the names and uh, on the weekends. And I would just spend my weekends up there helping her do a sports cast. And fast forward, right when I was graduating, they had some new ownership takeover. And I said, can I just do the sports cast for you guys for free? Like, can I, can I do it while, you know, she can't do, she, she doesn't want to do it. So they gave me like a six weekend trial period. And um, I always say I could never be as nervous as I was then because I had like friends at school watching me on TV. Um, and I'm, you know, just turning 22. And uh, yeah, and I, I had that six weekend trial period and they were, they had to pay me, they paid me $8 an hour. So my first TV job was $8 an hour. Yeah. And um, I ended up working in um, Utica for three years and I was going to get out of the business until I got the job in Buffalo. And that's, that, that was crazy. IVB called. They had a tape on their shelf for a while and they called to have me like fill in on the weekends because they had at the time people might remember these names. Of course, you remember Van Miller yeah. and Billy Vargas and Paul Peck and they needed one. They were all traveling so much. They needed one more person. So um, I was that guy that got to come in and do that um, back in 1996. And um, that was also the year I got the job with the Sabres as a travel traveled with them for a year and was what, their intermission what, and pregame host. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah, for a whole yeah. year, um, the 96-97 season, Ted Nolan's last year, um, the first time he was with the team, mm-hmm. um, I traveled with the team and did the, on the Empire Sports Network, I did the intermission and pregame. Oh, that was in the late, no, well, the reason I don't remember that is I didn't live in Buffalo at the time. I was in Ohio. That's why I wouldn't remember yeah. that. Yeah, so, so that was so, 90s. Yeah, that was when so I it was the late 90s. I got to tell you, I mean, I was a fan of yours. I, I thought you're, you're, I, I loved watching you. I like Paul Peck too. What I could tell I'm my background. I was a sportscaster, as you know, for many years mm-hmm. in Ohio, but for 10 years, but um, so I had a different view of things. And what I could tell is that you worked hard and that I could tell you can, I can tell who's writing their stuff and who's trying to get, you know, whether it's just high, would, would, cause I know as a, sometimes a pain to collect highlights, get them edited, um, do the voiceover when you're love. But I always felt like you were, I guess I would say you were always prepared. And I think um, I just enjoyed watching you work because when you're, when you're writing for, as a sportscaster, you were writing to entertain and to inform. Mm -hmm. Right. 
And uh, I just thought you had a good skill set, which obviously carried into your other career, which we're going to get to, to in a minute. So you were at Channel 4, though, for quite a few years. Yeah, uh, before, a while. Yeah. Like 10, 11 years. Yeah, uh, 96 to 08. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's a time. Uh, and then uh, visually we lost you. You're back, Dennis. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, Audio-wise, sure. I think it's still good. So yeah. then, um, then you, you, make, you make the pivot, right? You make mm -hmm. a pivot to, uh, well, into sales. So talk to us about that. Yeah, so, so what happened in 08 was I was a little bit surprised when um, IVB decided, you know, they weren't going to renew my contract at one point. And at the time, I was sort of moonlighting and doing a radio show in the evenings on WGR. And that's where you were at the time at Intercom. And once I wasn't on TV anymore, I was still doing the radio show, but that wasn't going to pay the bills, doing a couple hours of radio every night. So I had always thought about sales. I had been in to talk to um, our sales department before, and it kind of had been in the back of my mind. I, I was one of those people that always looked 10 years ahead. Like I'm, I'm always kind of thinking, what, what is the business going to look like in 10 years? And if you go back to 2005, 2006, it, it, it didn't take a rocket scientist to see that local sports casting was going to go away basically. And it has right No, yep. It's still, I mean, in Buffalo, you guys still have a little bit of it, right. but there's tons of affiliates across the country that don't even have a sports department anymore. Yeah. Right. Big markets or they have one person. Right. And even in my time there, we went from IVB had a sports uh, department of, you know, seven people, two producers, four on air photographer wow. to like four and then three, right. Like it just shrunk even in my time there. So, I saw the writing on the wall. I had to figure something out. I wasn't going to be, and then, and then I got forced into it. So yeah, I'll never forget going down the hall and talking to the management team over, down the hall. And you were one of them at, at, at Intercom and saying, can I just try this sales thing and sell my own endorsements? And like, I knew I had a, a great relationship and people might remember FWS, the furniture <laughs> retailer there. And I'm like, I feel like I could land them. And, um, and that's how it went. That's how it started. I, I kind of had a soft landing into sales because I was able to sort of sell my own endorsements. And I always say people would take my meetings, but they don't give you your money unless that's you can right. convince them to, you know, and, and, and that it's going to help them, but their business, people just don't hand money to their friends. So um, in, in that, in that world. So I was able to, to get a few sales under my belt and, and you were a huge inspiration for me that, that I can remember some of the sales training that you were doing at the time about storytelling and like, I mean, this is, this, you know, I could get into this. This kind of parallels what I was already doing. And instead of telling stories about sports, you're telling stories about businesses and what, what's their why, what's their story. And it's just the way, the way you kind of made it interesting was, got me inspired. So I, I went and, um, you know, I worked hard for Intercom for a short period of time. And then I got a call from Channel 2. Um, my friend Jim Tolner, who used to work at WIVB, was the general manager there. And he said, you should come in and talk to me. Um, I know you've been thinking about this. We've talked about it for a number of years. I think now's the time. So, um, yeah, so he was, yeah, he was able to hire me over there. So, and that's where everything kind of started. Yeah, you, um, yeah, Jim Tolner, I got to give him a lot. I don't know him personally. I know, I know him in, in the business world, but he had a vision. Um, I got, I, I'm going to say, I was right. Okay. I, <laughs> I, I, I I'm I'm so, I'm really proud of you because I I knew what kind of skill set you had, but I also knew you were a hard worker. But it was beyond that you you had the writing ability. And so when I was pitching, I think Dennis should really be in in sales. But what sales experience does he have? And it's a common it's a common what sales experience does he have? Yeah, the guy's a, a writer, and he he's going he's going to go from he's got tons of sales experience. He's gone he he knows how to uh, create stories. Um, and he's going to shift from information education to creating stories that persuade. He's going to help business owners uh, connect with the community, and he's going to help these businesses make money. I mean, they, um, so I lost that battle. Um, Channel Two won that battle, uh, which was <laughs> was 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 great for you. And you saw you said it's something really critical because you had, you know, you, you had you were you were a known commodity in the market, right? So anyone that knew sports might know you they'd say oh come on and let's talk sports but that opened the door but you had to close the deal and you did right. that through writing stories and you crushed it you crushed it at channel two it was not surprising you did really well uh and and 
but and and you made money you you made money for yourself for the biz for the for channel two and and obviously for your clients but then you you pack up and you head west what tell us uh, why um you left buffalo well so i i had gotten on the radar with uh at the time it was gannett they're now tegna with the coal company i'd been to a leadership conference and and some other things and you know, in, in a perfect world, you know, you're, you're going to get promoted in, in Buffalo into a management position potentially into, you know, I was thinking I wanted to not, you know, be a rep forever. And I, I wanted to try to get into management and lead people and, 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 and run a sales organization. So um, I, I kind of know Buffalo, right? Like people don't often move from their good positions they have. And, and at the time there were two people there that were, were I was pretty sure we're going to stay for, you know, indefinitely. And, and I had a couple opportunities to move. And the, the most appealing one was a business development manager job in Sacramento, California at the same company. Um, you know, it was an ABC affiliate, um, a station that was actually struggling. I was going from like a number one rated, you know, top notch station to a station that was, you know, second, third in the market. But it was an exciting challenge. I love the team there. I love the director of sales that I was going to work for. And it was an amazing run. I, I got promoted into like a regional business development person. And then I was director of sales at that station. Um, and I spent, um, you know, seven plus years at that station and, and had a, you know, had a great, great run with Tegna. Um, Dennis, again, we lost, had just, there you are, you're back. We lost your audio yeah. for a second. You're back. Oh, okay. I got an alert there. Um, so anyway, um, just just a great a great run um, and uh, great people, great station, and loved California. It was a great adventure uh, for my kids. They got to see a new part of the world, and they've got to experience so much by, you know, getting out of Buffalo. I always knew I could come back if I wanted to, but I, I had to take this adventure with with the family, and uh, for the most part, it worked out. Well, now you've uh, extended. I mean, you you are a uh you are certainly um, a big part of the business world now. So you went uh, and you decided to eventually start your own company a few years ago, right? Co you're, you're the co-founder of Three Bridges Consulting. Um, and why don't you tell us more about Three Bridges Consulting, sales and marketing consulting, right? Okay. Go into detail for us. Yeah. Yeah. So we were, um, I, I have a business partner who had the same, a similar background as me. He was a director of sales at the NBC station, which is one of Tegna's largest stations in Denver. He's in Denver. So he and I are business partners. We, we both sort of at the same time decided again, I was looking 10 years ahead. I was like, I don't know what TV, local TV is going to be in 10 years. I, I saw the attrition of, of, of the dollars and I saw the national business, you know, go in the, in the dumper and then, local business is very difficult because you're only navigating one product really, you know, right. you're trying to get into di digital, but it's really your core product is 90% of your business. And as hard as you try to get that digital products going, it's, you're still reselling other people's stuff. So I just saw where the business was going. And, and on top of that, you're dealing, when you become a director of sales, you're dealing with a lot of corporate stuff. And that's not me. I'm an entrepreneur. I can't be sort of told what to do all the time. And here, get me these spreadsheets and da da da, da. I love the people part of it. I love managing people. I love being around my friends and helping guide them. And I loved going on calls with reps. I mean, I never gave that up. I was never the sales manager that sat in the office. So I, I, I missed that. But I've just decided that we, and we, we were very deliberate about not calling ourselves an agency because of that's like a dirty word inside TV and radio stations, right? Like agency, right? You're just taking your agency commission and, and then you're that that's all you do. Right. So we really wanted to be full on business consultants. We felt like we both had an opportunity to, if the business needed it, help them with their sales training, right down to like, how are you answering the phones? So we can get you the audience through digital, traditional means, TV, radio, outdoor, uh, social media. We can, we can navigate all of that. We're going to get you the audience. We're going to find that audience. We're going to tell the story, get it in front of the right audience. But how are you going to convert that audience, right? How are you going to convert that audience into a customer, whether you're selling cars or HVAC or whatever, how are you going to get people into your casino? Wh whatever, whatever your product is, um, we want to help with all of that if possible. So we've been able to do that. And one of our, one of our, my great passions is working with startups. Um, because what we're able to do is, in some cases, become their CMO, 
their chief marketing officer without them having to hire a chief marketing officer. So, so much more of their money can go to R and D developing their business and their strategy. And then we can just sort of take that lane to help them with their marketing and you don't have to hire some, you know, huge marketing team and, you know, use all your early funds. So, um, so that's been fun for us. That's been fun. The startup world is, is interesting. And I, and I, we have a long way to go there. We want to really sort of dive into it even more, but it's been good. Tell us the story behind three bridges. Um, so another mentor of mine used to talk about how he was a sales trainer, really a uh, good sales trainer. And he would talk about building bridges to your best customer. And those bridges have to be solid and unbreakable. Right. So I was like, wow, that's really cool. And then one day I was sitting in my office and I looked up and I saw this painting that it's a print of a painting. It's a a good story. So it might take a minute or two. My dad's first cousin was a very famous watercolor painter. His name was David Armstrong. And he was commissioned to paint the three bridges of Latrobe for Arnold Palmer's 65th birthday. Yeah. Right. So mm-hmm. it was Arnie's 65th birthday. He was commissioned to paint this watercolor, Three Bridges of Latrobe. And I have a print of it. It's one of my most prized possessions, signed by Arnold Palmer and David. And hence the name. I saw that and I was like, oh my God, Three Bridges, Three Bridges of Latrobe, Three Bridges Consulting. It hit me. I brought it to my partner. I told him the story about where we're going to be building bridges to, you know, your best customer. And it just, it all kind of came together. We just kind of, and, um, and then we have our, our, our bridges are, um, we think every every business needs to be curious, creative, and competitive. So those are our three pillars. Those are our three bridges. Mm-hmm. You need to have your curious bridge, your creative bridge, and you need to be competitive. So that's that's part of it too. That's we can kind of weave that in as well. Well, at the time of this recording, we are just before Thanksgiving of 2020, and uh, we see the light at the end of the tunnel with with COVID and and the vaccine coming out. Um, by mid-December uh, and for the rest of every, you know, hopefully by Q2 2021, we'll have a lot of people uh, vaccinated. How has COVID affected business for you? Well, interesting, you know, I, it, it's, it's been good and bad. There's been some positives with it. Um, we have a large heating and air client that we doubled down when it happened. He was an essential service and he didn't want to pull out he didn't want to pull his budget so you rewind to march april and may and he got a hundred percent share of voice in the sacramento market and so on some of the tv stations we were on and radio and because of that when it got hot in june he literally had his best month in the 40-year history of his company because he didn't he didn't go away like that's the story right like you can grab market share during those difficult times if you just, if you have the fortitude to do it, it's scary, right? But if you have, you know, I've heard it happen in the auto industry, the same type of thing, the guys that stay the course, even if they don't have the inventory or the cars or whatever, stay the course, keep advertising. And when, when the dust settles, you're going to be the brand that people remember, especially if you respond, we, you'll like this, we, we designed the creative to show the safety measures that they were going to use going into your house, right? So we, we completely pivoted all the creative as well. So that, that combined to be a, a, a really good story for us. I would say the most difficult thing for us is that my partner and I are both very relationship oriented, you know, people like business people and to not be interacting personally, to be on zoom all the time and not be out at events and things where we're meeting people and making connections and doing all that. I mean, there's only so much like LinkedIn you can do to drive new business or Mm -hmm. um, phone calls you can make. I mean, cold calls, whatever, even if it's a warm call, like I'm very much like, I've got to be in your presence. We have to talk in person. So I would say that's been the hardest part for, for us, for me, but we've done knock on wood. We've, we've done okay this year, you know, with, with under all the circumstances, um, you know, um, but I think, you know, I, I can't wait till next year. I can't, to your point, the vaccine and being able to be back to normal and seeing people and talking to people and interacting and all of that will be awesome again. Great message though in there is that there's actually an opportunity to take advantage of the situation if you have the intestinal fortitude. If you have the guts to go ahead and go for it while while your competitors might be curling up in a ball, uh, if you have good creative working with a company like yourself, 
we work with you guys, a small business, and they have the right messaging. Uh, maybe they have some brand equity right now uh, and they could own it. I mean, it's a great example is the HVAC company you have. They, you said they said 100, 100% share of voice because everyone else went dark. Right. You know, right. And it's yeah. a great opportunity. Not only that, inventory uh, as you know is there's a lot of inventory right now what happens when there's a lot of inventory well that means there's less demand when there's a lot of inventory and and the rates are generous you know and it's this opportunity if you already have your messaging in place to take advantage of those uh, those fire sales exactly and we negotiate actually rather than taking you know renegotiating our deals mm -hmm we just negotiated like 30% bonus because they had the inventory right. at every yeah, station. So we it. got a 30% lift. So not only did we have all that inventory we'd already purchased, yeah. we're not going to take any money off the table. We're going to get 30% more. And everybody did it. Like every, nobody's going to turn that down and they're not, everybody else is pulling their budgets. Right. So, um, right. so, so yeah, so it was a great opportunity. And then again, like, you know, the way Sacramento is, it gets really hot in the summer. So yeah. the second the air conditioner started breaking down, yeah. he was getting the phone calls. So, well, you yeah, also, so what you, what you also did is what I love is, yeah, you rec, this is where, uh, uh you, because your background, you also recognize that, you know, they have budgets to hit and how it all trickles down. You know how the management's paid, you know how account executives are paid. And the last thing they want to do is say is pull money or renegotiate. You already renegotiated the deal. And so you're going to honor that deal. And what you said is if you're going to be a partner of ours, help our guys out. Cause I know you have the inventory and they said, absolutely. And they helped you out and you'll remember that they'll remember that you helped them out. And, and it reflects well on your client as well. Because how many times were you when you were in media and, and the media buyer from a big agency would come in and just try to beat you up? Uh, you know, did you ever want to take care of those people down the road? Not no. Really. You wanted no. people that were looking for your help, your assistance, right. wanted to partner with you, wanted to figure out how we could best get clients results. And, and you know what, if you made a mistake, they had your back. If they made a mistake, you had their back and you figured out what was best interest of the, of, of the, uh, of the client. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, the other thing too, I think, um, Steve is, uh, we, we are able to really look under the hood. And I think in these times people are looking for areas to save money. Yeah. So one of the things based on our experience, that sets us apart is having worked inside a station sort of like when you worked inside radio right mm -hmm. you, you there's no secrets like you know what the rate you know what you should be paying like yeah. in every month and every week and a lot of these just agencies there we know because we were on the other side they're kind of guessing right mm -hmm. they're kind of guessing what the market's going to do um you know we know so i think we have a, a, a decided advantage in being able to look at what people are doing and analyze whether they're getting you know a, a good shake they're getting a good deal right so um, that's what I would implore people to do there, there, they should come to you and, and, you know, like, you know, co come to somebody who knows, right. That's not guessing. Um, and that's, that's super helpful. Yeah. That's a really good point. I mean, you, yeah, we, we were on the other side. So, yeah. So we, 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 uh, it's not just guessing you all also, I mean, we also understand how it works. So the, the mechanisms of it, like yeah, you said, yeah. So, um, yeah. But also, you have that, you, want, you, you were on that other side where you were mistreated, and you remembered that. And so you're not going to do that to somebody else. You're going to Absolutely. represent yourself, your company, and your clients in a professional manner. And you're yep. going to, and you, you, you want to be, you want to help that account executive or the sales manager. You don't want to beat them up. You want to figure out how to help them at the same time, work together to help your client. I mean, it's just, right. a, it's a no brainer. And, and the way it goes down so many times really makes me sick. But anyway, listen, I want, I, I read, I read your, your blog post on your dad. So I was like, where, where does Dennis get all this, this from? So your dad's a, a lifelong salesperson, right? So it's yeah. in, it's in your, it's, it's in your blood. Tell us, I'm trying to remember the title of that uh, blog post. I don't remember what it was. It was like was. lessons from dad or yeah. something like that. Yeah. yeah. Tell, tell yeah. me what you learned. Tell me what you learned uh, from your dad who to me, it, it meant a lot to me to read that because I'm like, well, Dennis went from, you pivoted, you pivoted when you were in college and then you pivoted when you, as your professional career a couple of times, and now you own your own company and your dad was, is, was in sales, but he would pivot multiple times as well. He didn't just stay right. in 
in track, look for other opportunities. Sales is kind of in your blood. Nothing wrong with that either. Right. Sales is a good thing, by the way. Right. I think my favorite story is that he came, he, he was, he's kind of an entrepreneur too. He came up here to Cape Cod when I was seven years old to live here just because he wanted to live here. He'd spent five straight summers as a kid working on the Cape and he just wanted to live here and he was tired of living in Virginia and he didn't even have a job. He just walked into a home improvement company and got a job as a sales guy. And the best, the, the best story he told me from that was there were all these, they would get all these leads. It was sort of like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, right? They'd get all these leads and, and he would take the scraps because he was new and he would take the one window replacement or the door. He, he wasn't getting the room additions and the full on remodeling stuff. Like he was getting the scraps, but he would take them because he would turn those scraps into deal, bigger deals, right? He would go in and he learned how to Hey, you could do this or you could do that. And he just got, he was creative about figuring out ways to, um, you know, to, to get the, to get the deal done, right. To, to get the deal bigger or to, to change it. it there was no bad leads for him, which I loved. Hmm. Um, and, and I, and I've taken that too, because I can't tell you how many times I've taken like a small client and then they become your big client because you, you kind of, you, you'll grow with them. Right. So, that's kind of a, a good lesson for everybody. Don't judge, don't judge a lead just by like, Oh my gosh, the opportunity is, you know, $500 or whatever, like go, go after all of them. And, and who knows, right. You can turn it into something. So that's probably the best. And he was just relentless, you know, he's competitive. And um, I, that's a big thing for me is I, you know, I think when I was hiring people and I look at salespeople, I think you can't teach compete, you know, you've got to have that um, in your blood. Um, you can't motivate somebody to be competitive. So um, he, he, he was the most, he's like the most competitive person I know. So, um, so that was super helpful. Yeah. A lot of times I'll judge. Yeah. Competitive. You're either competitive if you're not, or, or, or you're not. Um, but as far as new businesses, you know, you might not be for everybody. I'm not for everybody. Uh, you know, there has to be a connection and um some of my favorite people are just super small businesses and they're just mm -hmm. really good people. So what do you want mm -hmm. to do? You want to help them succeed. Right. And, uh, they're, they're, yeah, there's not a lot of money there, but there's nothing more gratifying than helping them. And then they slowly grow. Right. And uh, you're mm -hmm. part of that team forever. Oh, it's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. So, sure. all right. Um, I, I just, I, I can't let you go without, we got to talk two things. Um, and maybe it's less now. I've been, I've been out of the, the sports casting world for whatever, um, 20 something years, but there was always high demand. A lot of people wanted those positions. And so I would always, I would always uh, get asked, you know, what, what, what do your people call my kid wants to do this? What do you suggest? What do you get? What do you tell people when they say they want to be a news anchor or a sports caster or a reporter? And I want to get into journalism in a second too. Well, what do you yeah, so it's hard. It's it's hard for me to like um, tell to, to advise somebody to go in any kind of direction you and I went in because it just doesn't exist the same way right, right now, right? Right. So I think the best thing you can be now is if you want to get in that world, is you want to be your own brand, right? You don't want to be the station's brand or um, hitch your wagon the the network or anything like that. What you want to do is be a personality and be a storyteller and be be interesting and entertaining. And then, then you, the sky's the limit. I mean, you see these people popping up all the time, um, you know, whether it's on TikTok or Instagram or whatever, you know, where they come out of nowhere because they have their own angle and they become their own brand. So I don't, we didn't have the opportunity to do that. Um, right. We did in some ways, you know, you can think about sportscasters that were their own kind of their own brand. But in this day and age, it's, there's so much opportunity to do that. Um, and, and so I would, I would encourage people to be like, you know, it, it's all personality driven. And can you write? Can you tell us stories? Can you articulate yourself? Like, it, can you, all of that matters so much. So if, if that's your passion, then, then go for it. Like, do that. Set up your own podcast. Right. Um, you know, have your own Instagram feed. Like, be on TikTok. Like, all of that stuff. And, and be different. And if you can do that, it's, there's ne the opportunity's never been better. Be interesting on Twitter, be something somebody wants to follow, right? Have, have your, have your interesting stuff. So yeah, I think if you're, if you're that, it's an exciting time to try and get into media or sports casting or whatever label you want to put on it now. 
know, when someone says, well, I'd like to be a, uh, I'd like to be a play-by-play guy for an NFL team. I'm like, well, that's like saying I want to be the quarterback of an NFL team. Actually, there's right. fewer opportunities. There's more opportunities for quarterbacks than there are for play-by-play guys, you know. <laughs> so you might, but, you, but the thing that, that, that they have now that we didn't have are opportunities just to practice themselves. I mean, they can, mm-hmm. like you said, create their own podcast. They can record whatever they want, want to do. Just they have tools and technology that just didn't exist 5, 10, 15, and even 20 years ago, obviously. Right. So um, when it comes to journalism, I, uh, as, as a, a, a former journalist, um, I have been really disappointed. I don't know what your feeling is, but I, I have seen, I understand clickbait. I understand how that whole thing has to work. But I, I see now opinions being part of a journalist when it's not there's like when it's in radio there is a opinion radio right say it's a uh, uh, fam- you know rush limbaugh that's that's not news that is opinion right but what i'm seeing is a cross where uh, i see opinions and headlines opinions and yes. headlines and i so i'm really uh really disappointed where where journalism's going and, and i'm wondering where can i remember thinking oh my gosh you know People are actually getting their news from from Twitter. Where are they get? Where are they supposed to get their news now? You know, anything that's not, everything has some kind of angle to it. Everything has a spin. It's interesting, but it's it's sad. Yeah, I I don't know what the answer is that, but I one hundred percent agree with you. I think there's every single thing I see, and and I watch I watch Good Morning America pretty regularly, the ABC, and I am blown away at their correspondence, how opinionated they are. Like it is so clear, like that they are giving, just not laying out facts, they're giving out opinion. And I think part of it is that there's, there's like one side or the other now. Um, But I think what people have to remember is almost everything we hear is opinion, right? Because there's only certain things, because what we try to do to people is we try to say, you're right, you're wrong. Well, nobody's right or wrong. It's an opinion, right? And even, so, so as long as everybody's aware that almost everything they're seeing is opinion, the only thing that's right is like, this is a pen, right? Yes. Nobody's going to tell me this isn't a pen, right? That's right and wrong. There's certain things that are factual, right? So in journalism, it's so skewed. I think everybody should go in and be like, I got to assume there's a spin on this every time. Like, because exactly. nobody can really just lay it. Like there's no right or wrong. It's, it, it, it's there. The facts are always able to be skewed right so and i don't know that that's that new i just think it's because the media is so in your face now all the time 24 yeah, 7 yeah. that it's it's just taken over it's a it's great question it's a great point is it is it any different than it used to be or is it is it different now just because i have access to it just right constantly or it pops up and you check it out so it's i you know i i don't yeah, great point. I don't, I don't really know the answer. Um, but I even see now fact checking or fact checking. And it's like, oh, they're fact checking. So that means this is real. They're fact checking opinions. How do you fact check an opinion? <laughs> right. What? Right. Just, and then they fact check opinions and the fact checking of the opinion is an opinion. That's not fact checking. Yeah. We have a lot of confusion. Well, I, I go back to it. Yeah, I go back to the right and wrong thing. Like when you really think about what you can be right about. And the other thing is, if you're, if it's somebody that you respect or like, would you, you, why don't you value that they have a different opinion? Right. Than you? you wouldn't want somebody you like to be wrong. Right. Like I don't want, I don't. We could be different on something. I wouldn't be like Stephen. I want you to be wrong. No, right. I want. I'm fine if you have a different opinion. Like that's, to me, that's that's how people should be thinking. Like if you're at Thanksgiving dinner and you're arguing about politics this Thanksgiving, which everybody will be doing, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Like, just remember that person sitting across the table isn't wrong. It's just their opinion. That's right. That's that's it. That's it. And then it makes it so much easier to have a conversation if both sides realize that and and then respect it. That's right. I'm I'm amazed at the lack of respect. Yeah, that's a great point too. That is a great point. And, and, and I think that comes from, from our, our dealings in business in that, I mean, I will be with a, a, a client and maybe there's a couple of us there. I'll have a different opinion from someone on my own team or mm-hmm. with the client. Um, and that's okay. I mean, I like to yeah. always be right. 
but <laughs> I like to, and I'm, the best ideas are my own, right? Always, but, <laughs> right, right. but it's great to, to be checking out and have, to hear that other opinion, hear that on the other angle and to respect each other and then come to a, a decision based on, on this information that we, or opinions that we go back and forth on. I think it's a, it's a good thing to have different opinions. I don't want the Absolutely. same. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Think critically. I mean, that's what you learn all along. And that's what you learn as a journalist. Think critically, yeah. Yeah. question things and know that there are multiple angles to every story. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. Yep. So, all right. I can't also can't let you go without talking sports a little bit. So okay. uh, I don't know how much of the bills you get to see people in Buffalo. Well, almost every game. I don't okay. miss it. I don't miss it. I'm still so, a huge bills fan. Well, that's cool to hear. So you spent all those years covering the bills. What are you thinking? What are seven and three at this time? Um, I, you know, they're in first place in the AFC East. Looks like they, they can win this division. Can this be a year they go somewhere? Well, I'll tell you, they have the offense to do it. I don't think mm -hmm. there's any question about it. I mean, Josh Allen has shown he's legit, and, and I think they're, you know, Dave Ball is, is a great coordinator, and they're doing the right things on offense for sure. And, and I think they can match up anybody offensively. I think they showed that recently with Seattle. I think if they had it to do over again, they would spread them out and go after Kansas City rather yep. than trying to slow that game down. I think I think they get another shot at them. It's, it's, it's going to be a better story. I, I still worry about this defense. Like, I'm shocked. I mean, they've gotten better the last couple of weeks. But I can't tell you how shocked I was at how bad they've been. Like, I, I just blown away at how teams have, like, run over them a couple times this year. And, and um, you know, I know they've been banged up. And, um, you know, and I know the, the, the catch that Hopkins made was, you know, they played perfect defense on that. They just didn't knock the ball down. Like, they yeah. had the three guys in the right spot. And it just, you know, it was just the perfect storm. But I, I'm a little concerned about their defense. I think that they're, you know, they could, they could make a run. They have seen so good. They could make a run this year. Um, but they're in such a good position. I mean, their quarterback's 24 years old and he's one of the best in the league and they've got all young guys across that offense. Um, you know, I just think that they're in such a good position for the next few years and that's exciting. It's been a long time coming. And I don't think you could literally draw up a better guy for Buffalo than Josh Allen. Like, oh. I don't think you could mold somebody in a factory that's better for that city than that guy. Like it's absolutely extraordinary that they found him, that he's turned out this good and that, um, you know, th there's just nothing not to like about him. Like really. So I'm excited. I love watching the games. Um, still a huge fan and, and nobody deserves a championship more than that city and the Bills mafia. That's for sure. Yeah. He, uh, he had a four game struggle. I really think his left shoulder was had to be bothering him. He's not going to tell anybody about that, but even though it's not his throwing shoulder, when you're trying to throw and yeah. you're, he was he was off for for a few games, and I I really think that shoulder affected him. And I don't I don't know if he's wearing a brace on it now or not, but I know it was wrapped before, but I don't see it anymore. Yeah, and then they've got this week to heal, so hopefully yeah. they'll be you know they'll be coming out of the gates next week and, and ready to rock and roll. So no, I'm I'm excited about the rest of this year, and and again I you know. This might not be their year to get to the Super Bowl, but they could make a little run and then and then keep building for for next year. And I mean, I kind of want it to be a year when the fans are there. So, like, isn't amazing? Like, it's, let's it's, just make a little it? run this year and get some experience in the playoffs and and uh, and 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 tune up for you know 2021 when the fans are going to be back and the mafia is back and they can go win the go win the Super Bowl next year. <laughs> I really didn't think. I mean, right now we're, we're, we're 10 games in. I did not think they were going to get this season in. I can't believe they've been able to, the NFL that is, to do what they've done because I thought the NBA did it right. It was NHL with the bubble. Um, you, I don't know how you do a bubble in the NFL. It's not going to work. You can't, Too many players, yeah, and they're not can, doing a bubble, really. They're trying right. to stay in their own world, and they're testing all the time, but it's it's complicated. Yeah, I, I just yeah. – and then when you start having some cancer, some some COVID outbreaks, I'm like, oh, boy, this season's over. I can't believe they made it this far. I really – I really – I was way off. Well, here's here's why I thought all along they were going to play this season. It's too much money. Oh, I know they're it's going a lot to figure out. It's it's just too. It, I mean, I like the it's it's, it's mind-bogglingly more than the other sports. Those television yeah. contracts they had to have them on TV this year. Billions. Yeah. I mean, it's it's nothing like any of the other sports. So, and and it, it just I had a feeling they were going to figure it out. And even their COVID pro protocols are a little bit iffy. <laughs> like it's yeah. like this guy had it, but he didn't have contact with this yeah. guy. So we're going to put him over here and. 
like didn't they all have contact like yeah. i don't know <laughs> like, so it is a little bit and they have their own like rules which is the nfl always has but it's it's all good i'm glad they're playing and it's so great I. for all of all of our you know <sighs> you know we're stuck at home a lot and you know you can't go anywhere so it's good for all of us to have something Oh, on my Sundays. daughter's into it, so watching it is great. You know, at this point, how – so we the Bills had a bye week. We were watching some of the Packers and the Colts, a few minutes of it, mm-hmm. and this guy scores a touchdown and uh, does a leap into the into the crowd of 20,000 people. There are not many people there. Uh, leaps in the crowd. These people aren't wearing masks. You know, their masks oh, are down. He's jumping. They're if I'm, if I'm an NFL owner or coach, I'm like, do not – you know, I cannot – can't have Stay away from everybody. It's too big of <laughs> too big of an asset. Yeah, I was like, yeah. oh man, that's crazy. We forgot about but, the yeah. pandemic, you know. So yeah. hey, Dennis. Uh, so the name of your company again? Great story. Uh, to me, w- y- your story is look ahead, figure out what's going on, build a strategy, and 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 go for it. Find out what you what you have a passion for. You certainly have a passion for business, entrepreneurship, helping people, helping clients, which which is part of sales. So sales has that stink to it. Uh, you're yeah. good at what you do. The name of your company is Three Bridges Consulting. Website threebridgesconsulting.co. Yeah. Is that right? Yep. Three. Yep. The number three. The number, the number three, three. Bridges Consulting. Uh, dot co uh and dennis uh, so if uh, if i'm in uh kansas city missouri i could give you a call to check out your absolutely website. anywhere in the country we, i i travel a lot so we i just got i just came from south florida we have a client down in south florida that we do mm-hmm. extensive work with um a startup actually called dentures today they want to be the smile direct of dentures which is okay. a whole nother story we mm-hmm. can get into another time but um it's it's a great startup story and then yeah so i i we, i'm all over the place in denver a lot i'm on the east coast a lot so but midwest and anywhere yep well dennis good to see you and hear from you again great to uh, see you too yeah man. Awesome. congratulations to you on your success and uh looking forward hopefully you and i can uh can work together soon i would love that and same to you congratulations on all your success back there in buffalo but i'm not surprised thanks dennis thanks all right, you can download all of our Sidewalk Talk podcasts uh, on your podcast platform of choice. Uh, you can also watch any of our podcasts by visiting our website, uh, shovelthesidewalk.com. Uh, and if you, have, if you have a story uh, that you need to share or someone you know has a story that to share that's a, a story of inspiration, information, education, just put it there on the website. We'll get back to you and we'll, we'll get you on a future podcast. Thanks again, Dennis. Thank you out there for uh, listening, watching, participating. I'm Steve Fortunato, and this has been Sidewalk Talk.